Um, I'm going to read a quote from our president in a statement we made on 28 November 2022. Men are the perpetrators of gender-based violence, and it is therefore men that need to change. It is men as husbands and partners, as fathers, colleagues, peers, and classmates, who need to consider their own attitudes towards women and girls. And I think this is quite fitting for our conversation today. One of the purposes of 60 Days of Activism, the whole campaign, is to bring awareness around gender-based violence, but I also feel that we must start moving away from just bringing awareness but rather to taking accountability. Um, the, solving the problem of gender-based violence does not specifically rest on the shoulders of women and children. It rests on the shoulders of each and every one of us. Um, our president also, way back in 2021, specifically called upon men to, make, to discuss gender-based violence, to discuss bringing awareness, to discuss taking accountability. So it is also quite fitting that today's panel consists mostly of men, um, who will discuss this with us, to discuss the role men can play in preventing gender-based violence and what it means to take accountability. So with that being said, I'm going to hand over to the panelists and each of them to introduce themselves, starting here on my left. Hi, I'm Samantha Sawell Moore and I am the very proud daughter of a boxing champion and Hall of Famer, Willie Sawell. And the reason I raise that is because this is the very day that my parents made a vow of honouring marriage. Um, and for over 50 years, my dad did just that. And I'm very grateful to be a woman of a man who was honourable to his vow of love and raised strong women. So from that, I was actually moved towards becoming a person who wanted to help people to become their best selves. And I studied occupational therapy, psychology, and specialised in trauma work before founding an organization in 2011 called Growing Champions, actually honoring the growth of my mother, the educator, and my father, the champion, the overcomer, to help children born into violence, to actually not continue the cycle of perpetration and violence, but rather champion change and become change leaders. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, my name is Nero Ramatoto. I'm a Growing Champions change leader, and I lead change against gender-based violence. I started a project called the Gender Based Violence Program, which is about educating the youth on how our everyday behaviors perpetuates the violence against women and how we can shift from that and move in a new direction. We also have the Fearless Together campaign where we do walks and runs, where we invite men and women of all ages to come together to live fearlessly and move together and just um, you know your involvement in the community is also quite important so thanks for that introduction yes uh, good morning my name is Malashi Mabunda I'm a counselor a facilitator and trainer I'm an activist as well when it comes to gender-based violence because I'm from the township I grew up in the township I know the hardships young children and women are facing every day and unfortunately most of the communities we know of these cases but we kind of hide it because of shame and all of that but through my uh, movement where i've been involved with, with training in the communities churches and even organization i work mostly with with young people i prefer to work with young people because i believe we can shape their future and they can relearn a uh, certain behavior and maybe i've learned certain behavior which they've learned from their parents because most are from dysfunctional families and we know some of them are about to grow up and to become uh, perpetrators as well. And I also do talks on radio and uh, with the aim of reaching out to, to people and just for people to take accountability because we sick and tired of each and every year doing this campaign, but nothing happens. Thank you. As the saying goes, prevention is better than cure at the end of the day. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Lexton Boyson. I'm from an organization called Men of War. Now, uh, we started off just taking drugs, what drugs is doing to the community and everything. But if you look a little bit deeper into it, you realize that because of drugs, gender-based violence is there. And because of drugs, gender-based violence is almost like legalized in the eyes of the perpetrator. So we try to bring awareness, 
but to also teach a child about gender-based violence. That's what we do. Okay. Thank you so much. And again, welcome. And I do hope we have a good conversation. We're quite excited for this conversation. Before we go on, I'm, I, don't, I don't want us to focus on legal aspects today necessarily, but I do just want to touch on some recent developments in law. In, you know, the law ties to develop in such an extent so that we can help curb um, gender-based violence as well. And one of these recent um, developments is around domestic violence. And we all know that domestic violence is quite big, one of the biggest causes um, when we get to gender-based violence. And specifically on bail applications. So recent developments in law um, deal with bail application and it makes it a little bit harder for a perpetrator to be released out on bail. Um, you know, for example, they took away, um, as soon as any matter is dealing with a domestic violence type of assault, um, for example, then there's no such thing as police bail available anymore for them. So they have to go through the court procedure. So again, strengthening the requirements a little bit. And an important one as well is that the law has developed in such a sense that the complainant's view can now be taken into account before the perpetrator can be released out on bail. And that's also quite a big thing. And the reason why I'm mentioning is that this is a, the law tells us what we can do. The law tells us what we're not allowed to do. The law tells us the consequences of our actions. But we as human beings make those choices of our actions. We decide how we want to act on a daily basis. Um, so that's the reason why I want to um, mention that and just segue into that conversation now. So I'm going to ask you the first question um, for today. I'm going to keep it open for um, anyone to address us in this instance. So with the knowledge of men being predominantly the perpetrators of gender-based violence, what are some of the common forms of gender-based violence and what are the root causes of this reality? Anyone want to start? Malashi, do you maybe want to start off? I think my brother had mentioned this. <laughs> <laughs> so when, uh, from my perspective, I mean, like I said, I'm from, from Mamlodi, but also uh, I've seen this in different townships whereby most men, I mean, men are the perpetrators and he mentioned that uh, alcohol and, and drugs are the major causes of this. I mean, I've also been in a situation whereby I've seen families whereby during the week it's, it's all good and cool. But come weekends, we know that both parents are, are drinking, are taking alcohol, drinking alcohol, and it's gonna be it's gonna be chaos. And the unfortunate part of that is we kind of normalize this. We know it's happening, and when it keeps happening, we don't even intervene because we said no, they are like that. So in in my situation, our belief drugs and alcohol are, are the main cause whereby. Of course, I, I believe, I don't know, but you can, I believe it always reveals the true person because, it, yes, because once you are high, either alcohol or drugs, you tend to reveal yourself. And this is how most people will justify their behavior, saying, I was drunk and I'm, I'm high. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's my point. Um, I see Samantha's very eager Because I agree with you guys that drugs and alcohol really does uh, extend you, like, it really makes it bigger. Yes. And, it's, and we saw that with the COVID, you know, how domestic violence went down when there was less access to these things. Yes. But the underlying cause is the person. Yes. Um, because of their psychology and how they normalize into society, what is acceptable, what's unacceptable, what is expected from men, what's expected from women, and, um, and the damage that happens watching the cycles of violence that gets deeply entrenched into the psychology of the person. So I think it's a, the alcohol and the drugs are almost secondary. Yes. You know what I mean? To, to what's happening, we forget to feed our people. We forget to notice love and care, which is really important. So if you think about township life, there's very little parenting happening for the children. I mean, a lot of them are walking on the streets. I, I remember in Eldorado Park, and I think you come from that place, if I'm correct? Eden Park, yes. Eden Park, oh no, sorry, my yeah. mistake. So um, yeah, I've done a lot of work in Eldorado Park and um, other places too, but there, I, a child came up to a, a, an uncle and asked for a meal and got a, a, a brick thrown at his head, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so if you're having that kind of thing happening, where your basic needs to be loved and to love, are being written out of the equation, it's very hard to develop into a person that doesn't go for drugs and alcohol to be able to handle your emotions, to therefore be able to step into life and manage all the expectations of popularity 
um, owning possessions, um, you know, having all these things that men have to do to be able to be adequate men yes. in society. So yes. I think it's huge, but it's, it's almost secondary to the underlying thing of being human, and we're missing it, you know? Yeah, just my thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Um, Gladys, you want to maybe add? You <laughs> initiated the conversation, yeah, actually, yeah. way back in the <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think, I think uh, it is because we have unlearned how to be me in the first place. Exactly. Uh, anyone, if you, can, if you can walk up to a boy right now and ask him what it is to be a me, Without words, he will tell you that in some way you need to oppress a woman or a child. Uh, we think that being a man is to use muscles. Yes, that's what we think is yes. Uh, and there is no one currently teaching us that no, it is the wrong way. Mm -hmm. It should actually be like this. Uh, I like saying that we are a stereotypical being. We come to a place where we see where we see something is wrong, but because I don't want to be the voice, I don't say anything. So I think we should go back to a place where we try to teach the child, because it is difficult to teach a grown-up person. Mm -hmm. And especially uh, for me, me as an example, I'm, I'm a recovering drug dealer. Uh, I'm fresh out of prison. I've made my fair share of mistakes. So, do you think that anyone would listen to me come to tell them, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do this, do you understand? So people also has this thing of listen, uh, listening to a certain elite of people, you should have this or be this kind of person to be listened to. Yet, I know it is wrong to, to oppress women and children. But not everyone will listen to me. Sure. sure. But while we're on that topic, and you know, Samantha, you mentioned it, what it means to be the man, you mentioned it as well. And we have this stereotype, you specifically use the word stereotypical, um, about you know, what a man is supposed to do and how a man is supposed to act. And, but how do we get rid of that stereotype? Um, you know, in one of the sessions we've had, um, a question that was asked as well is how do we teach our young? boys, for example, to you know, walk away from this um, How do we get rid of that toxic masculinity um, stereotype? Um, I'd like to say, first we need to define what toxic masculinity is, and we need to re redefine certain values that are taught in what makes a man. Yes, you know, being strong, being brave, being courage, like you tell us that, and you say we mustn't cry and all of that. That is wrong. But I believe that we should redefine what being strong means. I, I watched a video uh, yesterday of Coach and me, and the person said that men should be strong enough to admit how they feel, admit their wrongs. They should be strong enough to cry, because we told that we're not allowed to cry as a man. I'm being told that even when, like, since high school, or if I'm crying, I'm like, you're so weak, toughen up. We need to redefine what being brave means. Being brave as young men, we need to be brave in certain circles and say what you're doing is wrong. Cat calling a woman is wrong. We need to stand up to our friends because most of the time it's our friends. And, and I'm used to like laughing at I'm used to just saying that I'm cool with them. So we need to be more courageous, be more brave. We need to redefine those values into a non-toxic way into a more positive light. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting. And also, you know, what I got for me as well is like with the definition of strong, moving away from a physical aspect and more on an emotional, yes. psychological. Yes. 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 I, think, you to add I think that I think even the words toxic masculinity needs to be questioned mm -hmm. because it's exactly what you said, Gladstone. It's, it's toxic stereotyping for yes. men or women. Um, and when we say toxic masculinity, we almost tell people that masculinity is toxic. Yeah. And that's what's happened, is our men have lost their leadership. Mm -hmm. They don't know who they are, they don't know who they're allowed to be. Mm -hmm. And every time you be an actual man in society, you feel like maybe you're stepping into that 
toxic space. Sure. You know? And I think it's dangerous because men have great leadership potential and power to, um, to really create the change in the pathway that you're asking for. How do we make the change? It's a whole pathway through society, isn't it? Mm. Every institution that exists, whether it's a school, whether it's a um, you know, sports club, needs to start teaching people how to behave in a respectful, dignified way towards other people. All of us. But then also our common day behaviours, everyday behaviours that we use, like Nero said so beautifully, is, is it's about starting with us, you know. And I love the fact that you are stepping into your community from these places where you've learned from life. And that's what I think so beautiful is that, you know, I, I, I studied at university and I walked into a space and realized I didn't have a clue about anything in this township life. Yeah. I was a fool and I had this high education. It was nothing because we had to navigate together. And this is why this is such a beautiful opportunity, my legal wise, is to give us the opportunity to sit at a round table and have the real conversation so everyone contributes, everyone enters the conversation because this is ours, mm. our problem, it's a, it's a community problem, sure. it's not a gender problem, it's a human problem, yes. you know, and so your voice should be heard, Gladstone, because you have learned the hard way, the truth, mm. I might have learned it from a textbook, mm. you know, mm. you have learned it the hard way, and so both of us have power, both of us have something to offer at the table, to serve up, but we don't have these conversations often enough. Mm. Yeah. And we, we, we hardly do that. I mean, what, what you've just mentioned of moving from the action into feelings is men hardly go into feelings. We kind of close everything, we don't verbalize how we feel. And sometimes it's good even anger is a feeling, as much as joy is a feeling. I mean, but when I'm angry, I'll be seen as it's, it's unacceptable for me to, to, be, to be angry. Hence, we, we kind of not express ourselves and to a point where we, we explode. If, if you look at the stats, it will tell you that most abusers, some would be people who are quite keeping things to, be, to themselves until to a certain point where they can't take it anymore because what they don't want to talk about it. And also with the, the gender stereotype things need to be changed. Definitely. You know, we as men, we are men are very selective. We are selective. It's okay for me to cry or to be angry when my team loses, but I can't cry when my relationship ends because that's related to being weak. Yeah. But, and if I go outside and my team is uh, considered gone and I'm angry, it's okay. But when I get home and something has gone wrong and I cry, my friend will say, be a man. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Like, like you said, toughen up. You know? Yes. Um, I want to ask a question, Malashi. So you, you, you mentioned that you know, you've got this anger, this built up anger. You don't know how to deal necessarily. I don't want to go into a whole counseling session here, but um, your experience as a counselor, if you can maybe give a very, very short tip maybe on how to better take control of your feelings. If you get to that point where you feel you want to explode of your feelings, I mean, what, what can you do then? Instead of reacting in a physical way, rather channel that energy into something else. I, I, I always, personally, I always channel it somewhere else. For, for instance, I, when I'm angry and maybe it's a situation in the house which has made me angry, it's, I can say that like this is all about it's self-control. At the end of the day, it's self-control. Believe you me, I can be in the same house where I've had an argument with my partner. I'm able, and I don't know how I've done that, but it's my coping skills. I can switch on the laptop, listen to my music, start writing, or watch something, and I will definitely take it off there and challenge somewhere. And then that's how I cool down. Sometimes I also I'll joke, I'll go out and start joking. Yes, that, that's how I cope. So I believe everyone should find their own coping mechanism. Clancy, you may want to add something on that. Uh, have, you, have, you, have you seen uh, walking up to a boy child who's angry, angry about something? He can break down something like that and you give him a hug. The first moment when you come into contact with the stuffness mm. we have mm. inside. Mm. Uh, without saying anything, we are teaching children to be angry. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching a child uh, to be angry just by walking in the manner that I'm walking. Mm. 
just by the look in my eyes. Uh, I've realized that giving a child a hug <clears throat> even takes away the anger that I'm teasing with. Sure. I also believe that before getting angry, I have a choice. Mm. I have a choice right now. Sure. Uh, George said this about me. Mm. And now I'm going to be angry at George. Mm. But I have a choice. It's always, even, how, uh, even if how small the window is, but choice mm. comes into play right before you get angry. Sure. Mm. Now I think we should teach people that you have a choice. Mm. Yes, everybody heard what George said about me, mm. but I also have a choice not to say anything mm. in response. Mm. I don't have to say anything. The problem also is that uh, we are not in control of our own lives. People decide how I feel, like someone decide this one, now I should feel today, and yet they are going on with their lives. Here I'm sitting, being moping around, being not at everyone, when someone else decided. You understand? I, I think, I really, really think that um, we should go back to our communities and stay on a high building and scream so that everyone can come back to us. Because really, we cannot go to have topics like this. And there's a lot that needs attention. But when we're going to talk about a man bullying, a child bullying, every year here in year out everything else is doing is not getting attention mm -hmm. that's my take on it so and that also you know like you say now you know bringing that awareness at some point loses its effect as well um, like you said you talk and talk and talk about it mm -hmm. but there's no action mm -hmm. so what does it mean to take accountability because as i said in my introduction as well you need to start moving from teaching educating mm -hmm. rather to how do you take accountability? How, what does it mean to take accountability, especially with gender-based violence? You know, the first thing that you think about is accountability, take accountability for your actions. Um, you know, for example, the perpetrator going to the police and handing himself over. Um, but what other types of accountability matters? I, I think also the accountability in that regard is two ways. It's me personally, whereby the light reflect direct to me to say, I mean, to what you're saying is someone can just do something and decide how you feel. I think we should stop that from happening to say I cannot be dictated as to how my day is going to, to be like. Mm -hmm. To take the remote control back into my head to say this is what you have done but I'm going to do one, two, three. Not exactly how you want me to do things. So accountability in a sense that we should stop blaming everything and everyone and start looking at ourselves. You have mentioned that you know the alcohol, where I'm coming from, and the drugs, those are things that people can use to justify their behavior. But deep down, there's the psychology that this person, we're putting other things just to hide, just to, uh, to uh, put the blame on something else. Accountability is if I know my brother's abusing, and which is something that is not happening, if I know that my brother's abusing the girlfriend, I would go to defend my brother. I wouldn't even report it. When he get arrested, I'll make bail for him. Yeah. And in that way, somewhat and what I'm promoting this to happen because in most cases, this brother will come out of jail and he will perpetrate again. In this case, he would not just cause body harm, but he will kill the person. And so in that, we need to report regardless of who the person is. And we need to start talking and shaming our friends because we know several of our friends who are abusing their, their partners and children, but we don't say anything about it. And as we even do that, I may be a counselor, but I may be abusing my partner. You know, I may, may be a hypocrite. When I go there, I help people to mend their relationship. But when I get home, I'm a different person. So I need to look at myself. If I say I love this person, is this love how I treat her? Is this love, love how I treat her? I'm raising two, two children, a boy and a child. I always kiss my son and I say I love him because I want him to know what love is. Mm. 
and I also kiss my daughter and say I love you, so that when she grows up and she go outside and she doesn't find love, she know that this is not love and she would tolerate it. Yes, but what she said, accountability is me not being quite quiet about something that I know. Mostly in the community, I know that my friend is doing the same thing. I know the uncle next door is doing the same But I'm not saying because I don't want to be married. Uh, at Men of War, uh, we, we, we started the group inside of the group. It says, not in our name. You can call me up 3 o'clock in the morning, I will get out of my bed. No one, especially drug addicts, act of addicts, no one will beat up or abuse on any woman or child, not in my name. Sure. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to bait mouth the police here, but we are at a place where when it is not about what the police will get out of it, you will wait for 5-10 hours until someone is dead, is dead or, or up until someone must go to a hospital before the police arrives. So, I put it on social media. You can call me. I call up my friends. We go to your house and whatever you did, I know this is criminal, I know this is wrong, but still I'm standing by my own word. No one will abuse a woman or a child. Mm. Because the problem is your abused child comes to a school where a child is different than you say more say no. Mm. Mm. And then you bring this child to this child mm. and you make them play together. Mm. Whatever this child is going to rubs off on this child. Sure. And because this child that gets it all as all it don't doesn't know how to deal with this. Uh, I feel sorry for this child. And then I become like this child. The anger that the abused child has rubs all off on my child and now my child becomes the bully. That's right. Not understanding that he is standing in the game for a friend that he loves with something that has got nothing to do with him. So you are learning, you know, what you're saying is what it's like. You must try to avoid you know, learning from others' actions. Yes. Um, I'm going to hand over to you now, Samantha. I just want to add something on what you say. So I also want to just mention that you must also be very um, wary about not taking the law into our own hands. Yes. Um, you know, you know, one of the reactions might be you're hearing about somebody abusing his spouse, for example, mm -hmm. and your reaction would might be one to be to go and abuse that person. Mm -hmm. So do not take the law into your own hands. I mean, that will lead to other consequences now um, for you. So deal with it in a, in a proper manner as well with reporting um, and, you know, trying to just um, settle the matters coolly and calmly as possible. So I think you wanted to still sure. add something. Yeah, I've really got a lot to say <laughs> from what you guys are saying. I, you trigger in so many thoughts uh, of, of the realisms of what happens in this, in this process. And I hear you, Gladstone in terms of you know when you feel that there isn't uh, intervention happening it does become a problem in communities but i wanted to talk a little bit about trauma and what happens because if you think about the violence cycles that we're having around our communities trauma affects the brain and it affects the development of the brain like when you spoke about the bully the victim of the bully becoming or the target of the bully becoming a bully mm. it's a normal psychological response so what happens in trauma is that our, our um, logical and uh, language-centered brain, half of our brain, and our emotional brain get like, an get like an invisible wall that divides them. So when we see a situation, we find it hard to bring reason and logic into the emotion. And we can have these rage spins, wheel spins of emotion, and we can't get back to the logic. So if I just spill that water on you, walk past and spill the water, and you feel something's attacking you, you could lash out and hit me, but you wouldn't because you think, you know, shame, she just bumped the table, right? You'd be able to see it in the context of this. <laughs> but if you don't have that, if you have a divide in your brain um, that has been caused by the trauma that we have in our country, it's very hard for you to actually make that, that distinction. And I've seen it on our soccer field. Um, you know, we have a, a soccer team and I've seen when a coach is shouting at a player instructions, they feel attacked. 
Yes. He's actually encouraging them. He's actually trying to help them to do better. And he's coaching them. They recognize it as being shouted at and attacked. And then there's a reaction and a breakdown in the men on the field. And these are the, the things that happen very commonly inside of us. And the other thing that you spoke about was the pause. Um, that pause between what you do. And, and you know, research, international research is just showing over and over again, it's not us tripping that's causing breakdowns in violence. It's actually the belief and attitude that a man is superior to a woman, and he can do this. It's not, I can have no control, because when it comes down to hitting her, for example, he will hit her in places that will not be visible in yes. public space. He's very calculated, and he's doing it in a way that is going to help him. He's not lost control. He's giving himself permission, and that's the pause. No permission. You know, at that pause, to say, like you said, I move myself away, I start to use my sensory systems to help me to desensitize from the stress, and I start to get back to bringing back logic to the pain, you know. And I think that's, those are really important. So NAO is running, a, a, running quite a few campaigns, but one of them is called the AND Project. It's a new direction, A-N-D, right? And he's talking to youth in schools and around the communities about how do we move our culture in a new direction. How do we break that man box where men have to fit into this toxic way of living? Sure. And how do we start as youth to move in a new direction? Mm -hmm. And bring the, the whole community together because we all need each other. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no point. If I sit around a table with people exactly the same as me with the same experience, where do we go? Mm -hmm. You know, we need each other. Each one of us brings something. And I think this is what well, I'm saying it again and again, but there needs to be a pathway. You know, that we help people when you've, to prevent violence and also if you've been a victim of violence or perpetrator of violence, how do you move from this place to the next? And you spoke about shame. And I mean, shame is a silencer. It stops people from talking because they feel bad in themselves. I'm a bad person. Not what I did was bad. I'm a bad person. And therefore I'm stuck. I will always be this way. I can't tell you how many times I've heard men say this. This is who I am. Right? This is who you, this is how you're living now, but we can transform. And I love the human brain and body and spirit because we are transformers. Sure. We are transformers. And I, mean, I always use this analogy, but I think it's really helpful. You know, when you're a little baby, um, you couldn't stop yourself from growing up. <laughs> okay? You grew up. So it's a natural process for us. But then what happens in us mentally and, you know, emotionally? But spiritually, are we growing or are we staying stuck? Um, because we're naturally meant to grow. You know, so that's just my, my thoughts on what you guys said. I think it's so powerful. Everything that's been mentioned here is so powerful for helping us have this conversation. But you, you mentioned something which I believe also I've seen it. Uh, attitude and um, social yes. whereby uh, you mentioned of the values. But attitude has so anything to do with that because you know, if someone spills water on you, if you think it could be, perhaps it's a mistake and all that, you'll let it go. But there are those people in the communities, especially the land behavior, whereby we tend to see and people who are, who are violent, we, we know gangs, people who are gangsterism in the township, who are driving fancy cars and all that. We know they, they do not value women at all. And we, we, we learn from that. And Shame also could protect perpetrators. We've seen families where we believe or think they are functional, but only later to find that actually there's an abusive happening in that relationship or in that family. But because the man, the perpetrator, holds an influential position in the community, so he could be a pastor or anything, or he's a director of a big company. Therefore, the woman and the kids wouldn't come out to say we are suffering because of the, the that will, they, by not saying that they're protecting their perpetrators, but indirectly they feel shame. If I say this, how will people look at me? Yeah. It is powerful. It is actually very powerful now that I'm thinking about it. Someone that is being abused believes that this is the right way. Mm. Yes. This must happen to me. Mm. Uh, you see a girl moving out of an abusive relationship into a new relationship. Mm -hmm. And then there comes a time where she would look to trigger the boyfriend mm -hmm. or the partner
to to abuse her because this is what she thinks love entails. Mm. I must be beaten up. I must be abused. Even a child. My problem is mostly the children. What's happening to the children? Because we we will be left with no generation to come. Mm. Mm. There will be no one. Mm. No one if we can't teach them now. Yes. So I've heard a lot of talk about children um, and youth, and you know we all say now you know we have to teach our youth. And we've got to pose the next question today. Uh, you've mentioned that he's been busy with these projects as well. Um, how do we educate our children and make them aware about gender-based violence, and how to prevent that from happening? Honestly, I think we need um, more projects like the gender-based violence project because when it started, I thought that I was doing anything wrong. I'm like, nah, I'm against it, I'm not doing anything. But then, when you look at certain things called like rape culture, which is the mindset and behaviors that perpetuates this violence, it's like a pyramid, and at the top of the pyramid, it's rape, it's, the, it's a murder, and women look at it like, no, I don't do that. When you look at the bottom, that's when you see where we all are. There's certain things that's cat calling, there's the locker room talks, there is um, the victim blaming. And all of these behaviors make it tough for, like, victim blame makes it tough for the next woman to come out and say, I've been raped or anything. And now we start blaming them, what were you wearing? So now it's, it's not about the person who, who caused the violence, it's more about the victim now, and I'm making them feel bad. So now this carries on this violence, this culture of violence, and we're not getting anywhere. Um, when we look at certain places like um, social platforms, medias, there are people out there that are preaching a way to us kids that this is the way that we should behave. A real man is strong, a real man doesn't cry, a real man must abuse the, his partner. So now, I feel like if we can have platforms like this, more projects, if you can have people that most kids look up to come out and say that this is wrong, we need to move in a, in a new direction, I believe that we can be better. Also another way in which I believe that we can become better is, I feel like the way COVID happened, COVID is such a big thing, um, there was lockdown and put us in lockdown for like two years. But then the urgency day that the government, all governments around the world were looking at it, all the mitigations, the preventions, we should be having the same thing against GBV. Because yeah. GBV has been happening for how many years? Since, since. And I mean, one of the root causes of GBV is like traditions. Yes. So I feel like governments should be also focusing more into that. Even our textbooks, like our textbooks, I learned so much from the GBB project that like, I learned in school. My whole 12 years, I didn't learn much of that. The 500 billion that was given to COVID should be given to GBB cases. We need that, we need that platform to learn. So that's how I feel. And I believe if we could educate those young children and take away the thing of, you know, also we mentioned culture whereby you, you pay the order and you feel like you own the person now. If we could take that thing away, even in a relationship, just a mere relationship, to make them understand that they don't own anyone. And should it happen that the relationship ends, of course they need to be aware that they are going to get hurt they will be angry, they will be disappointed. But that part and parcel of life, of this relationship, they need to own that. And by so doing, I think they will learn to uh, control the emotion and control themselves. And also let them know that it's okay to cry. It's okay to cry. Men cry too. Yes. And also, we also need to talk to influential people, traditional leaders because they can also play a major role in keeping the, the gender-based violence. And pastors as well, 
they can preach this in their churches and by so doing because most people tend to take you know uh, leaves from those influential people and they can lead from the front they can be a good example i mean we, we do this in the communities but how many of us can, can i also just add um, mothers yes mothers play a very influential part in, in the lives of their children and most victims that i treat um, whether it's perpetrators or victims of abuse have been culti cultured by their own mothers to either treat women that way yes. or to accept being treated that way. Yes. And I think that there's a huge part here of women play as well. So we talk about the, you know, the celebrity status people, but also mm -hmm. in the home, if we can educate mothers and get them to start to shift, sure. it could help tremendously. Mm -hmm. I have a question on that on topic as well, but before I go on, um, I just want to also mention, I don't know which camera I should look into now, <laughs> but for the viewers watching us, um, we do, you, if you want to pose any questions, you can comment um, any questions that we can pose to the panelists. Um, so please do that because we are nearing the end of the conversation as well. Um, so based on that, the question that I wanted to ask is that Malasha mentioned it, like you mentioned it as well. Starting at home, you say, um, you know, you teach your children. But what happens in the cases where that children come from an abusive household. There's nobody there to teach them. Mm -hmm. what, how do you approach that aspect? Yeah. There's, you know, it's all good and well to say start at the home, yes. but some, you know, if you speak about domestic violence, that also starts at home. Yeah. Um, um, just to comment on that, because it's, it's very much what we do in Growing Champions, is work with kids who've come from those kind of backgrounds. And I think that there's a lot of community services like school um, where people can actually have that influence of showing them the right way and helping them identify, like you spoke so well about um, not recognizing that this is actually abuse, mm -hmm. thinking it's love, mm -hmm. um, it's those kind of things. When you, in, if we go into every single part of our society, like our churches, like our schools, you know, like our sports clubs, etc., and everywhere there's the same kind of input given to children. And then obviously inside of those spaces, people can highlight or highlight for the fact that there's a child that is abused or needs you know, intervention. And the law does require that you act. You're not allowed to sit back if yes. you get that information. Mm -hmm. But there is the possibility of transformation of these children. They can heal, they can be helped. And we've had people in our organization go from you know, being abusers and perpetrators on a very bad level and, and addicts, etc., prisoners, you know, having all those things to become leaders. And I think that's what you were saying as well. This is what we want more of, people to actually start hearing those voices. Mm -hmm. But it is possible if our, if our whole society starts to look at this differently. Like Nao said, and I just love it, you know, we should be dealing with the same intensity as COVID. Mm -hmm. We should. Mm -hmm. It's a crisis. I mean, the last lot of statistics, and I know they change all the time, but I mean, eight women a day are being murdered. Um, you know, I was listening to Australian statistics. That's one, one woman a week. Here, we've got eight women a day. You know, and it's it just escalates. So, so we need to take it much more seriously. And every every place needs to have training. You know, as coaches, you should be knowing how to stand against this and not allow rock, locker room talk. And uh, when you see this come down, like you said, giving examples with your children, what love is, how it should feel, how you can recognize it. So important. I had a girl that actually was saying to me she was raped by her brother, and at school she was never at school they had a talk. And then she realized she had been raped. She never understood what it was until that point. And she was, you know, a few years into her schooling life. Mm -hmm. So there are institutions that can help us. If we have a lot of this discussion, we have to get messy. We have to get uncomfortable to find solutions. We, we can't sit on the outside. The discussion and just being awareness as well. Is, I mean, all, most of us think, you know, it is um, the good topics to talk about. But we need to, um, you know, talk about this. Bringing away, like you said, that little girl doesn't, didn't even know she was there. Can I say one more thing? Yes, yes. Just that, and I'm sure you guys really, it resonates with you as well, resonates with you, is that it's not the monster out there that's doing this. Yes. You know, it's right in our homes. Mm -hmm. It's our brothers, our uncles, our fathers. Our, it's right here. We've got this thing. When we did the gender-based violence talks at schools, and I was an observer of Nao's class, I mean, the guys were sitting there stone-faced, and not interested and I was like I know these guys are passionate about racism and all these other things they're very active I'm like why are you not reacting to this girl telling you she's being be beaten by her by her brother and her mother saying it's okay because he's a boy he needs to get out his anger 
And they were like, well, because I'm not doing it and I'm not going to impose on my friend because then they could lose my belonging to the club. Sure, sure. You know? Yeah. So we've got to break that because it is everyday people. Mm. And we've got to move away from thinking that mm. it's out there. Mm. It's here. Gladstone, you want to add something of this as well? <laughs> you. No. We are in a very, very, very dangerous place yeah. in our lives. Uh, one of my leaders, Edmund Oko, Donovan Mini, once said something that stays with me. We as a community, we as a person, I am as guilty as the person, the offender, when I say nothing. Sure. Sure. By saying nothing, I say yes, this is the right thing that you are doing. So I am as guilty of the blue eye. I'm as guilty as the broken, uh, uh, for the broken child, mm -hmm. it is the one that did this mm -hmm. to the child. Mm -hmm. It's heartbreaking. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it got so worse that I remember I had a trauma session, a group trauma session, and these ladies were robbed uh, at their uh, work of place by men uh, with guns. And one lady said she's even struggling to cope at home. She can't sleep because the other time she woke in the middle of the night and she looked at the, the partner, the husband, and she was so scared of him saying, he's a man, he's capable of killing me as well. So it goes to ways that, like what you say, if we, we, we keep quiet, we become part of the problem. I mean, we were encouraging its continuation to say, go on, can we? But some women, my parting with some women also are to blame. Because if I'm a perpetrator and I've done something wrong, believe me, my mom will take my sight without even knowing. <laughs> <what to do. laughs> and even my sisters, and they'll even call the, the uh, victim names. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll protect me just because I'm one of theirs. But they wouldn't. Be looking at what I've done. So in this way, it's a fight that we as men want to win, but we also want women to come out and assist as well. As much as they are the most victims, but somewhat they are also promoting it by siding with the perpetrators. I mean, the eight, eight, eight women per day in South Africa, those are not just numbers. These are family members who are bearing their loved ones every weekend. These people have got names and some are leaving their, their kids as we end up having orphans and dysfunctional families because the mom will be killed, the father now goes to jail, maybe for life, and the kids will go without anyone. And those kids will go to the street and get a blesser, they get a door, so it becomes more like a second, a vicious second. We have to win together. We have to yes. win together. We have to, yeah. that's, that's where the accountability aspect comes as in as well. So we have run out of time. Unfortunately, I think we can go on talking so much on this topic as well. But I want to thank each and every one of you um, for participating today. I think it's quite an important discussion we had. Um, and I think what we all should you know, just take away from this um, session as well is, you know, we must be aware, we must be accountable, and we must be the change we want to see. I know it sounds like a cliche sometimes, but we really need to be the change that we want to see in this world, in this country. Thank you very much. Thanks for everybody um, who was watching for us. Um, I hope you learned something and you know, it's good just to talk about this. Okay, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.